Uh, if people can find a seat, then we'll um, of us. Then we'll read the Bible. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 12. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to God, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith is shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Well, thank you very much, and uh, it's really lovely to be with you. I've been looking forward to this for a long time, ever since I was invited, and... Um, uh, well done for making it, because I know it's uh, a big expense, and uh, expensive money and uh, time as well, and uh, I uh, have been praying that it would be a fruitful time, that those who've invested in it, uh, you who've made the effort to come, would uh, really reap some benefit uh, from that. We're going to be looking through 1 Peter, and uh, over the five um, sessions, we will cover all of it in terms of having it read, but we won't cover every verse within it in terms of the talk, so relax we won't, uh, won't keep you here all day and all night. Um, I've tried to tackle some of the one or two of the harder bits within talks because it was frustrating when those bits are left out. Um, but if you've got questions on other parts that we don't look at, please feel free to uh, come and grab me at a time and uh, I'll try and uh, help you with those. I think it is a wonderful topic we're looking at from a wonderful book. It's a wonderful topic because mission, reaching the loss for Christ, is what God is all about. Mission is not something dreamed up by Christians. It is God who was the first missionary. And mission lies at the very heart of God. What is the Bible about? It is the story of God's rescue plan for humanity and for this whole creation through Jesus Christ. In other words, this is not something that lies at the edge of God's plans. It is something that lies at the very center. Jesus Christ, who said, I have come to seek and to save the lost. He came into this world for the lost, that they may be found and saved. And therefore, we may say, mission should lie at the heart of the Christian life as well. This is not the tomato sauce around the side. This is the whatever you have in the middle of the plate, steak and potatoes. When Christians have a passion for seeing the lost saved, they are getting very close to the heart of God. 
and CUs were set up in the first place, let us remind each other, to reach the lost. That was why they came about. A great topic and a great book to look at the topic from. Chiefly because I think in some ways the situation that uh, the people Peter was writing to was not so very different from our own. When I became a Christian 30 years ago, 1992, the culture was just turning, um, uh, just on the turn really in England from being sympathetic to Christian, it was a, uh, come out of a sort of a Christian culture, to much more um, everyone has their own truth kind of a uh, culture. And then more recently, it's uh, morphed again, you might say, into a culture that's much more actively hostile to Christianity. It's definitely not uh, relativistic, anti-relativistic. Uh, if you believe Christian truths, they, these will actually harm you. They're actually bad for you. That's much more where we're at. And I think that was much more the situation Christians were in, who Peter was writing to, as we'll see. And I suppose the question for us is, how do we reach people for Christ in a culture that doesn't want the gospel, which in the end is most cultures, but certainly the culture that Peter was uh, writing into, as we'll see. Now, I hope this letter will help us to answer that. Uh, I've called it Five Keys to Mission, of which the first is know your identity. Know your identity. Just a word on uh, introduction. Peter begins with this simple but critical line of self-introduction. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And when you think about it, that is so encouraging. You remember Peter? You remember Peter in the Gospels as he's portrayed? So impulsive and so immature, spiritually immature. And you remember Peter on the, uh, the night that Jesus was betrayed? Um, that he couldn't even muster the courage to identify with Jesus before a servant girl. Like we're given this person, you remember when they were by the fire? You're given this person who is sort of the lowest of the low the most um, low-key sort of person. And Peter couldn't even muster the courage to identify with Jesus in front of her. He is hardly an evangelistic machine. And in Peter, there is hope for all of us. You see how Peter is turned around by the time he comes to write his letter. He's been forgiven, he's been cleansed, he's been restored, he's been set apart. In Peter, there is hope for every Christian. Yes, he writes as an apostle. He shows those two marks of an apostle. He had seen the risen Christ and he had been set apart, commissioned to speak God's words. But in him, there is a pattern for all of us to follow. We've been called and then commissioned, called to belong and then sent out to serve. And the two always go together. We've been saved to serve. And this is one of the ways we serve is by testifying to God who saved us. Now, Peter begins his letter by telling the Christians they have two great blessings. Uh, verses 1 and 2, a new identity. Verses 3 to, te to, to, to 9, a new hope. Let's have a think about those. New identity. This uh, little piece of paper here is one of the uh, more precious bits of paper that I own. Uh, in the... Um, uh, my um, study at home, I've got a, just a sort of ordinary cardboard box um, entitled Important Documents. And that's the sort of box that if the house goes up in fire, in flames, uh, contrary to any advice that might be given at the time, I will be going back in and uh, just rescuing that box. Now, within it is this certificate of citizenship. Uh, because uh, the day came in 2017, the 1st of March 2017, when Teresa and I went to a citizenship ceremony, and uh, it was a very special moment, an occasion we will always treasure. But what was striking to me at the time was, although it mattered to us and was important to us, when you saw some of the other people who were there, it was next level for them, and you could tell that. Some of them, as they walked across the stage, there was a visible outpouring of emotion. Some of them had their arms in the air, some of them were cheering, uh, yelping and the rest, literal shouts for joy, because there were people there that evening for whom life had changed forever. There were people, because you get given the names of people in the countries from where they've come, there were people from Afghanistan, people from Somalia, people from Iraq. And we, of course, didn't know their individual stories, but the point was, they knew them. They knew the backgrounds from which they had come. Some of them, no doubt, had suffered extreme deprivation. Maybe they'd come as refugees, maybe they'd been victims of persecution. But now, this new 
identity had been bestowed upon them, had changed their future forever. And no wonder this was such a special occasion for them. No wonder they were flooded with relief. No wonder they were bursting with uncontainable joy. They were now citizens of another country. A new future had opened up for them, had been granted to them, and life would never be the same again. And Christian people, people, Peter would have us know that we have undergone a similar but greater change in our own experience. Because when a person comes to put their faith in Jesus Christ, they become the bearer of a new identity. They now become one of God's people. They are now citizens of a new country, heaven itself. And that is how Peter wants them to think of themselves. Have a look at verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who've been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood grace and peace be yours in abundance. They're amazing words. To God's elect strangers in the world, literally exiles in the world. His readers were exiles, outcasts scattered over this area, which in modern day terms would be northern Turkey, very likely as persecution has driven them out from Israel and other nearby areas. They've been left with nothing. Truly, they are exiles. But Peter doesn't just mean um, exiles in a, in a physical sense. He uses this word, which I've got translated here as strangers in the world, to convey that within this world, they will always be exiles. Um, this world is not their home, never would be their home. They don't belong in this world. Well, I rather like the translation. They are now strangers within this world. Christians never do, never will call this world home. Because this is the world that crucified the Son of God. And those who are disciples of the Master cannot expect better treatment than the Master himself received. Everyone else around us, your contemporaries no doubt, are putting down roots here into this world. They're busy dropping anchor into this world. To them, this is the one life they will live. So party, 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 fun, 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 now, now, now. Their greatest joys will be here. Their greatest aspirations are here. Their greatest dreams uh, are here. One day if they have children, their greatest dreams for their children will be here. Comfort and ease and uh, property and uh, education and happiness. Many of the things they uh, either enjoy now or aspire to in the future, um, they're not bad things, but they are things that are bound by one thing, which is they are limited to this world. They are earthbound in their focus. This is the limit of their horizons. But Christians are not like that. And shame on us when we are. Uh, shame on us when we look no different to those around us, when we care more about the things of, that we can see than the things that we can't see, when our best enjoyments are in this world rather than the world to come. This isn't our home. Never was our home. Never will be our home. And Peter wants to remind his readers straight away that they now have a new identity. They are heading to a different land. He's going to have plenty to say on this. Uh, they are going to, um, they are the recipients of a new inheritance, as we'll see in a moment. And this sets the trajectory right from verse 1 onwards, that our eyes, our hearts, the direction of our lives are to be pointing forward to a different world, no less real and much more permanent. We have a different identity. For we are those who have been chosen. As he says to God's elect Elect means chosen, chosen by God. That is, God chose those who would be his. He put his finger upon them, chosen, we learn elsewhere, before the creation of the world, by, as we learn here, verse 2, the foreknowledge of God the Father. Just as God chose Israel in the Old Testament, so here we learn he has chosen Christians to be his. Uh, Peter's point is that you may be in the thick of the world, you may be scattered into small congregations, you may have only a few in your student group at the uni or the polytech where you are, but you should know that you are God's. You belong to God. God chose you. He wanted you. 
He had your face, your name, your person, you, the person you, in mind long before this world was even created. God didn't get lumped with you. God chose you. He wanted you. And this, he says, comes about through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. That is, it was the Spirit's work in us that opened our eyes and set us apart to be God's. And I don't know if you're um, uh, the kind of person who can remember the time at which you became a Christian, and some people can't, which is just as much a work of the Spirit, but some people can. I mean, it was a very dramatic change when your eyes were opened to who Jesus Christ was. Maybe there was a time in your life when you really didn't pay any attention at all to Jesus, and then the Spirit drew you to have an interest or a conviction began to feel you needed forgiveness and your eyes were open not only to your sin but also to the wonderful saviour Jesus. Well this was the Spirit's work and that's why he's going to have a lot to say about what it'll mean to live out being set apart. He's going to have a lot to say about how God won't let us, won't allow us to settle into the sin of being normal, of being just like everyone else. We're not normal. We've been set apart by the Spirit of God to reflect his glory in this world and as you see here for obedience to Jesus Christ this is why God has chosen us that we might obey Jesus definition of a Christian those who obey Jesus to be a Christian is to say that because Jesus is the Lord of all therefore I want to make him the Lord of my life because he's the Lord of everything I will submit to him and make him my Lord in other words, to be a Christian is to, be the, is to take the most rational decision it's possible to take. Because he's the Lord of all, therefore I'll make him my Lord. Now Peter wants them to know that they've been chosen, washed clean, and set free to live a, a, a new life. This is our new identity. New identity as God's people. The first question for us this evening, is that how you see yourself? Do you see yourself as Christian first and anything else, second, third, fourth, or fifth? Christian first and student, second, third, fourth, fifth. Christian first and uh, whatever your uh, uh, race or ethnic background, second, third, fourth, fifth. Christian first and your interests, second, third, fourth, or fifth. And is that how other people see you? When they see you, would they think, mm, yeah, that person, that person, they're a Christian? Because that's our primary identity. First identity is in Christ. And Peter wants us to look in the mirror and see Christian first. Christ's first. We belong to him first of all. When it comes to mission, it flows out of who we are. It flows out of being Christ's people. But if we don't see ourselves as that, we'll always struggle to have an impact on other people. As long as I see myself as being the same on other people, I'll never be able to call them to be different. As long as I admire what other people are into, I'll never have the conviction to call them to something else. And so we need to see ourselves as God's people, first of all, saved by him. New identity. And that new identity has given us, secondly, a new hope. Peter here identifies the first place where this really makes a difference which is the hope that we have been given. For ours is a hopeless world. Cue the current terrible mental health statistics. I see that suicide's up 30% in the last nine years. I don't know how you would describe your culture and your student culture. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty of good things to it, but I imagine there's an element as well which is angst-ridden or confused or divided or simply lost, which is how this world is. We live in a world that wants to get rid of the past, but doesn't know how to build for the future. It's a world that can tear down, doesn't know how to um, uh, build up. It's a world that uh, suffers from hopelessness. And it's into this lost world that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ shines like the summer sun and like a beacon of hope. Have a look at verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It bursts out of Peter. Why? Because in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He has given us hope and a living hope because we trust in 
the living Lord Jesus Christ. Such had been the impact of Jesus on Peter's own life. He changes the Jewish way of referring to God. Instead of uh, blessing the God of our fathers, he blesses the God who is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He blesses him for his mercy and for the new birth which has been given. Uh, to speak of the new birth is to speak of the change that has taken place, the radical change which God has brought about in us. That is, when a person becomes a Christian, it's as if they go to a funeral, their own funeral, because they kiss goodbye to their old life. It's now gone, 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 and gone. And they inherit a new life, new life with Jesus Christ. If you try and add Jesus to an existing life, what you find out, find out is that Jesus just always resides around the edge. And that's sometimes the problem when people kind of try and add Jesus in, they believe without repenting. What happens is he kind of takes a place around the edge, but they don't change anything, and in the end, inevitably, he falls off. When a person really becomes a Christian, it's as if they smash the whole plate and then have a new plate where he is at the center. Now notice here uh, three things. This hope is achieved through the resurrection of Jesus Christ in verse 3. To a lot of people, the thought that you can be sure of what's going to happen after death is just wish fulfillment. But this hope is anchored to the resurrection of Jesus. In other words, it is a hope that is based in history. I referenced before when Mark interviewed me about the person who uh, knocked on the door and then took me out for dinner a week later. During the course of dinner, and I will never I will remember this crystal clear now as any time in the past, during the course of dinner, he asked me a question. He said, James, tell me, what do you think about God? I said, I don't know. He said, what do you think about, that was the softener. And then the killer question, what do you think about Jesus? I said, well, I don't know. And then I said, but as far as I can tell, some people haven't got faith, like me, because I haven't really got an answer, and some people uh, have, like you. And uh, it's just a case of whether you've got faith or not. And I thought that would kind of divert him. But he said, well, of course, it's not really like that at all. It just depends on whether you're prepared to look at the evidence. I thought, evidence? I thought God was the thing for which there was no evidence by definition. You know, the great thing out there for which there is no evidence that you can't see and some people believe and some don't. He said, no, no, all prepared, whether you're prepared to look at the evidence. And the evidence, of course, more than anything else, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Witnessed by those who were there at the time, predicted beforehand uh, in the scriptures and by Jesus, and then seen by those who were witnesses at the time. And that, of course, was what changed those early disciples, men like Peter himself. One moment there they were, cowering in fear behind locked doors. The next they went out preaching to the world and calling on the whole world to repent. What explained that dramatic change in their own life was the fact they had met the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Our hope is anchored in history. And this is what we need to convey to people, to challenge people with. We believe not despite the evidence, but because of the evidence. Then you also notice that this hope is guaranteed through the power of God. Now look at the encouragement here. Um, verse 4, into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this world, all of our hopes are contingent on many factors and often human factors. You know, uh, like you got a flight booked, okay, you booked the flight, well done. Now it's contingent on COVID restrictions not changing, uh, on the airline having enough crew, and on there not being too much fog, either when you take off or when you land. Uh, in fact, it's contingent on so many factors, it's amazing that anyone ever gets on the plane and lands in the right place. Now here, Peter wants the Christians to know their inheritance has been guaranteed by God himself. And that's why it will never perish, spoil, or fade. How many things on earth can you say that about? How many things in your flat where you live never perish, spoil, or fade. Now, I actually did come across one thing this last week because one girl told me that she had kept a McDonald's burger in her cupboard for a year and it did not degrade in any way, shape, or form. 
<laughs> what are those things made of that they don't even have mould on even after a year in the cupboard? Maybe that's the exception. Everything else perishes, spoils or fades. That's what, that's what keeps Kmart and the warehouse in business. Uh, the need to replace what we already have because it always wears out or breaks. But you and I in Christ have an inheritance that is bubble wrapped, that is awaiting our arrival. What a prospect. Uh, some of us in this world may never really receive much of an inheritance, but for every believer, we will one day receive this wonderful gift. And this mouth-watering prospect, this magnetically compelling vision, says Peter, is guaranteed. In fact, not only is the inheritance guaranteed, but we are guaranteed to receive it. That's what he means there in verse 5. You who through faith are shielded by God's power. So the inheritance itself is kept for us. But we as Christians are shielded by God's power. It is guaranteed by him. And both of those things are protected, both the inheritance and those who will one day inherit. Over this last weekend, um, where I uh, had the privilege of speaking to uh, a student gathering, uh, there was um, uh, a girl there who'd become a Christian aged 11 and not from a Christian home. I said, well, how did that come about? And uh, I lost the finer details, but the key was her pony. And she went to a uh, pony club and she met other Christians and this, this was the way that uh, she became a Christian. I said, well, that was aged 11. How did you keep going through the teenage years? And she said, well, I don't know really. I haven't really got any human explanation for it. My family weren't Christians. I didn't know where a church was, and I was quite young, and I wouldn't have been probably able to get there. My mum wasn't super keen that I was a Christian, but somehow I just kept going. And then she said, I suppose it must have been God. <laughs> well, you can't disagree with that. God keeps his people. Usually he uses means, like churches and CUs and other ways, but he's perfectly capable of keeping his people any way, shape or form, with or without ponies and with or without churches. Uh, and here he kept this girl through her teenage years. Now that's what we uh, read here, uh, that God uh, guarantees his, uh, the salvation of his people. The third thing to notice is this hope is accessed by faith. Verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Okay, you've got a new identity. Through this new identity, you've got a new hope. And that hope came through faith in Jesus. It is through putting our trust in Jesus by which we gain this thing. Now, difficulties in life come, not so our faith will fall over, but to prove our faith genuine. Because how do you know that faith is genuine? You know it when it is scrutinized by the real trials of life and carries on nonetheless. A shallow or bogus faith is soon abandoned in the face of pain. Um, a faith that has as its center, what can I get out of this, will not survive painful trials. But genuine faith will only be strengthened in conviction by those trials. Because genuine faith, by definition, leans on God. And when people are put through the grinder, they cast themselves, if they're believers, on God, and he will sustain them. And so real faith shows itself in that way. I think of uh, a man, um, uh, I know, um, Gabriel Sharma, whose dad was a uh, high priest in the local Hindu temple. Uh, age 19, Gabriel heard the gospel and he became a Christian. He went back home and he told his parents uh, within a few days that he'd become his, a Christian. And the first thing his dad said to him, we are not your family and this is no longer your home. He said, I walked out that night with a backpack on my back and I realized a new life had become. Is that genuine faith? That is genuine faith. It's not in it for what I can get out of it. It's in it because it's real and it will stick through the trials. Now that's what's being said here, uh, that genuine faith, um, uh, in fact, not only sustains, but rejoices even through difficulty. Okay, let's wrap up. New identity has given us a new hope. 
And this new identity as God's people and the new hope which we've been given is so wonderful. Listen to how Peter speaks of it. Though you've not seen him, Jesus, you love him. And though you don't see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. He speaks of the joy that comes through his faith in Christ. We have a new identity as the people of God and a living hope where we are looking forward to being with Jesus. Jesus lies at the heart of our identity. We are followers of him. He lies at the heart of our hope. He links the two together. We're looking forward to being with him. And if we're going to be effective in witness, we need to be people of the risen king. We need to be Jesus's people. We need to look in the mirror and we see that we are followers of Jesus. That is our primary identity. The Puritan Samuel Rutherford said this, we want him talking about Jesus. I should refuse heaven if Christ were not there. Take Christ away from heaven, and it is but a poor, unheartsome, dark waste dwelling. Heaven without Christ would look like the direful land of death. I want heaven in order to have Christ, not Christ in order to have heaven. It is Jesus who is to be the center of our faith. He's the center of our new identity. He is the center of our living hope. <clears throat> and if we're going to be effective in witness, he needs to be at the center of everything we are and everything we do, for our message is about him. And that's what we'll see as we look on tomorrow. Let's say a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that in your kindness, you have shown mercy to us. We thank you that through Jesus, you have given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. Help us, we pray, always to be grateful for what you've done in us. And help us, we pray, to see ourselves as your people, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. First and foremost, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.